Okay, today we want to talk about molecular orbital theory, Hartree-Fock theory. And we've introduced this briefly in a previous talk talking about just quantum chemistry or electronic structure theory in general. But now it's time to get into a little bit more detail about exactly what is this and how does it really work and how do we run Hartree-Fock calculations and what kind of information do we get out of it. So uh, this time I'll go into a little more detail on the theoretical side uh, and then a little bit of more practical stuff uh, at the end. Um, and so certainly check out my notes uh, from uh, general intro to electronic structure theory to get a little background info about uh, setting this topic up. And let me borrow a couple slides from that talk just to uh, quickly remind you and set the stage. Um, what is Hartree-Fock molecular orbital theory for? Well, what it's for is to solve the electronic Schrodinger equation. And we uh, talked about that in that general electronic structure theory talk. But this electronic structure, uh, electronic Schrodinger equation, uh, we got from invoking the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And it basically says, what uh, are all the electrons doing? And what's the electronic wave function, which depends on all the coordinates of all the electrons, little r, and uh, parametrically on all the coordinates of the nuclei, which uh, in this approximation are temporarily frozen in space. And we get an electronic energy out of that, and that energy, of course, does depend on where those nuclei are, and that will map out the potential energy surface if we solve this for many different possible values of the nuclear coordinates. But this electronic wave function psi is our uh, target as well as this electronic energy because from psi we can compute all kinds of fun things. We can compute polarizability, dipole moment, things like that. Uh, and then um, if we uh, get derivatives of psi we can get more elaborate properties. Uh, from this potential energy surface, if we evaluate this at a handful of geometries, we can try to keep tweaking the geometry maybe to minimize the energy and that can give us an equilibrium geometry. And uh, getting the second derivative uh, of this electronic energy with respect to nuclear coordinates will give us vibrational frequencies. So there's many, many things we can extract uh, either directly from psi or from this energy or its derivatives. And uh, again, I'll briefly remind you, in, in uh, Hartree-Fock molecular orbital theory and in a lot of electronic structure theory, we're going to deal with a Slater determinant named after John Slater, um, which is going to postulate that the wave function for the electrons can be written as this determinant where uh, the rows of the determinant denote the different electrons in your system. So if you have n electrons, you'll have an n by n Slater determinant. Uh, and uh, each row corresponds to an electron, electron 1, electron 2, etc. And each column corresponds to a so-called spin orbital. Uh, and that's a one electron function that tells you how likely is it to find the electron at some particular place. And to get that, you would just say uh, chi star chi and that would tell you for an electron in that orbital, chi-1 or chi-3 or whichever one, how likely is it to find the electron at some point in space, depending on the uh, independent variable that you feed into that function. All right, so assuming one Slater determinant is what we do in Hartree-Fock, nobody ever said the electronic wave function could be written exactly as one Slater determinant, but that's what we're going to assume, and then see how far we can get. And then writing this Slater determinant is very tedious, so we'll write it in a shorthand notation with a ket, either by just listing all the spin orbitals or maybe even just the indices of the spin orbitals. All right, so, so much for um, a little background info. Now let's talk about what do you do in Hartree-Fock molecular orbital theory. Well, you invoke the Born-Oppenheimer approximation to get that electronic Schrodinger equation. Then you say, I'm going to use a single Slater determinant, and that's going to be my wave function. And then you invoke the variational theorem and apply the variational method and say those 
orbitals are going to be the ones that minimize the energy. And uh, it turns out, I'm not going to prove this right now, but it turns out those um, uh, uh, assumptions, the last couple assumptions, uh, wind up being equivalent to assuming that each electron sees just an average charge field due to the other electrons. And that averaging is what introduces a little bit of error to this procedure. Now let's do some of the mathematics behind this and uh, talk through how this all really works. So first off, we're going to use this one electron operator, we're going to call it little h, and I'm more or less following the notation of Zabo and Oslund's modern electronic structure theory book. Um, and the one electron operator is going to consist of two pieces. First piece is the kinetic energy of each electron. So electron I has a kinetic energy. This del squared operator is going to take the second derivative with respect to x, y, and z of, of electron I and its coordinates. And I am missing a few things like uh, h bar squared over two times the mass of the electron, but I'm going to use atomic units be so that all those things will simplify. So in atomic units, 4 pi epsilon naught goes to 1, h bar goes to 1, mass of the electron is 1, charge in the electron is 1. So that's going to be just way easier to write down. Then the second piece is going to be a potential energy term, and that is going to correspond to the attraction that each electron feels to all the nuclei. And you might have multiple nuclei in a molecule, uh, as long as it's something besides an atom, you're going to have more than one nucleus. Uh, so we'll sum over all these nuclei, and the nuclei will be represented by letters like A, B, and C, and the electrons will be represented by letters like I, J, and K. So Z, A is going to be the charge on the nucleus. So 1 for hydrogen, 2 for helium, etc. It's just the atomic number, basically, number of protons. All right. And this is just Coulomb's laws. The product of the charges in, in atomic units, the charge in the electron is just one, so, or minus one, so that's why there's a minus sign here. And four pi epsilon not goes away, and I just need the distance between electron I and nucleus A. So this operator then encapsulates um, all of the kinetic and potential energy that can be ascribed to a single electron. Now that's not the only kinds of interactions in the molecular Hamiltonian, which we talked about in a previous talk. There are also these two electron terms. And the two electron term is a Coulomb repulsion between uh, the two electrons, which have the same charge, so it's a repulsive interaction. And again, Coulomb's law in atomic units will just be one over the distance between the two electrons. Uh, and that's positive. Okay. Uh, those are all the kind of interactions I have in the molecular Hamiltonian if I have the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Don't need the kinetic energy operator for the nuclei because in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation the nuclei are temporarily considered to be frozen. So then the electronic Hamiltonian is then just a sum of the one electron operator for all the electrons. So I'm summing over electrons here. And then all the unique pairs of electrons give me an electron-electron repulsion. And if I'm numbering my electrons, you know, one, two, three, four, five, then I need like the one, two term, but not the two, one term, because that's the same term. And I only want to keep count each one once. Uh, so uh, I need a restriction like I is less than J or I is greater than J, pick your favorite. Uh, but the point is to not double count the interactions. And then, I talked about this in another talk, but we go ahead and tack on the nuclear-nuclear repulsion term, even though it's kind of a nuclear term, not an electronic term. It's just traditional to tack it on here, because if the nuclei are frozen in place, it's just a constant. We might as well go ahead and deal with it so we don't forget to, and that's where most people put it. So there is the electronic Hamiltonian now in terms of these new operators that I've introduced. Uh, so writing it this way is... Uh, easy to write down. I uh, didn't say it was hard, easy to solve, but it's easy to write that down anyway. Now the variational theorem tells me that I've got to minimize my orbitals until I get, um, uh, well, vary my orbitals until I get the minimum possible energy. So which energy is that exactly? I need to know uh, what energy I'm minimizing. Well, the energy I'm minimizing is the energy of my electronic wave function, and remember we've assumed it's a single Slater determinant. 
So I need to know if I've got a single Slater determinant made out of all these orbitals, um, chi's, what's the energy of that thing? Uh, because I need to somehow minimize that. Well, okay. Um, in general, any energy in quantum mechanics is an average value. So I'm hearing, writing it in Brockett notation. I'm assuming psi is normalized, otherwise I'd need a denominator to this expression. Um, and uh, the electronic energy is the average value of the electronic Hamiltonian. So that's easy to write, but it's all very formal, and I don't know how to evaluate that. Now, if I map from um, Brockett notation or Dirac notation back into integral notation, then I know it's this thing. Uh, the left-hand side turns into a psi star. The right-hand side just turns into psi. And that's an integral over all space, all the possible electron coordinates. Okay, and bold R captures all the electron coordinates in this case. Um, so they're just lumped into that one bold variable. Uh, all right, great, uh, but um, still this looks a little complicated because I know that H electronic from the previous slide was a sum of one electron terms and two electron terms. So I'd have to insert that into this expression. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all the details of that because that would take a very long time, but if you take a look at the Zabel and Oslin book, they'll work through all that for you, and basically we'll use something called Slater's Rules to calculate the, relative, the relevant matrix elements uh, and figure out uh, what this expression turns into. Uh, and uh, without going through that, I'll just give you the result um, and say it's this thing. It's the sum of um, one electron term, so this is this one electron operator I introduced, and now you've got the average value of the one electron operator uh, summed over all the different electrons in your system. And then I've got some two electron terms, so I've got a restricted sum uh, of all the unique pairs of electrons, and they give me these guys, these square bracket things, um, now, exactly what are these and what are those? Well, I haven't fully explained that yet, so let me do that now. Let's define some terms. So this thing on the left is called a one electron integral. And um, not surprisingly, I just use my kind of standard decoding rules for Brockett notation to know that the thing on the left gives me a, a function with a star on it, and the thing on the right just gives me a function. And uh, here it's implicit that we're doing Hartree-Fock and we're talking about spin orbitals, so that's why I know I and J turn into chi I and chi J, because uh, spin orbitals are the name of the game for Hartree-Fock. Um, and I'm integrating over all possible coordinates. Now here I'm using bold X the same way I did in my intro to quantum chemistry lecture. Bold X is gonna encapsulate the X, Y, and Z and spin coordinates of a single electron. Uh, so it's the same as bold R, but then I've also tacked on a spin coordinate. Uh, and then this H hat is just this H I introduced earlier. Now H doesn't depend on spin. It only cares about spatial coordinates. So I'll go ahead and put R1 instead of X1 here. And uh, if you gave me some function, chi J and chi I, then uh, I could in principle um, take some derivatives from the kinetic energy part, and, uh, and then do some Coulomb's law for the potential attraction to the nuclei part and somehow work out what this integral is. It might not be easy to do, but I could do it on paper if it, um, you know, if these functions chi weren't infinitely complicated. In reality, we'll get a computer program to uh, grind through this for us if we um, teach it a little bit about how to evaluate this. So sometimes we'll, um, wind up using specialized functions chi where we know how to write down a few equations and then we program those equations up uh, in, in analytic form uh, to evaluate uh, numerically on a computer. That's the one electron term. What are these other guys with the square brackets? Well, these are the two electron terms. Oh, and by the way, the one electron integral, I'm giving you the generalized form where the bra and ket indices might be different but in Hartree-Fock, it turns out they're the same. So it's I on the left, I on the right. Uh, this is just for general purposes for future topics. Um, similarly, um, in Hartree-Fock, I only have IIJJ and IJJI 
two electron integrals, but let me go ahead and define it in general because that can be useful for future topics. Let's call it IJKL. Uh, this is a uh, eight dimensional integral. Oh my goodness, why is it eight? Well, I've got X1, which has X, Y, Z, and omega, the spin coordinate for electron one, and then X, Y, Z, and omega for electron two, X2. And so there are eight dimensions there. And I integrate over all those dimensions. Uh, and this is how you decode this shorthand notation, which is what I want to write because it's easier to write, into this longer uh, integral, uh, eight-dimensional integral. It's over all space and spin coordinates of electron one and electron two that I integrate. And it's a Coulomb kind of interaction, a Coulomb's law kind of thing. Again, we're in atomic units, so there's why there's no four pi epsilon naught or anything. Uh, but it's the distance between electron one and electron two that um, attenuates this. And um, on the left, I have electron one, so it's x1 here and x1 there. But I use two different orbitals. And you might say, well, how can one electron be in two orbitals? Well, that's kind of a mathematical artifact of the Slater's rules, but you do need a product of orbitals here. Um, although notice here that only two indices wind up being needed instead of four that I have here in this general one. But anyway, uh, I need a product of orbitals here. So for electron one, I have one of them has a complex conjugate on it. The other one does not. And then for electron two, again, I need a product of orbitals. So here I'll do chi k star, and then the other one doesn't have a star, chi l. So that's it. And um, now if you were evaluating this integral, think about calculus for a second. Uh, if one over r12 is just the distance between electron one and electron two, then I could write this distance here, or I could move it over to the beginning of the whole expression or the end. And likewise, chi i star of x1, I could write that before chi j or after chi j. The order of these particular factors is irrelevant in terms of doing the calculus because there's no derivative operator here that acts on something and then I have to worry about what order they am doesn't matter um, as far as doing the integral the calculus is concerned. However, it does matter in terms of the bookkeeping and communicating from one scientist to another what you mean and what order they're in. So from a bookkeeping perspective, if I'm going to decode this symbol, bracket ij bar kl, as this integral, then I need to always put things in the same order um, just in terms of identifying what has a star on it, it's i, not j, uh, and what is electron one, and what is electron two, and I need to be kind of careful about that. Now actually, as far as electron one and electron two goes, I could do a swap, and uh, swap electron one with electron two, uh, and I'd get the same integral out, because it's just a dummy index of integration. But again, I'd need to swap that very carefully, uh, in such a way that I still goes with J and K still goes with L. So we'll kind of rigidly stick to decoding this symbol in exactly this way, in this order, just so we don't um, have a miscommunication or accidentally uh, flip which spin orbital goes with what and which one gets a star and which doesn't and all of these kind of things. Now in reality, in quantum chemistry, the way it's normally practiced, we don't use complex orbitals, so the stars will go away and some other things can be done. But uh, uh, we'll just kind of be a little careful with our bookkeeping. All right, now I've just defined some mathematical terms, but let's talk for a second about what do they mean physically. Well, let's look at this guy. Um, I, H, I, this was one of the one electron terms. I sum over all the electrons, but here's some particular orbital uh, I, and it decodes this way. Well, you can immediately see this is the kind of formula I have for an average value. An average value in quantum chemistry has some operator and then the same uh, wave function on the left and the right. Now this is not a full-blown wave function, psi, but it is kind of playing the role of a wave function for one particular electron at a time. Um, so it's an average value formula. Uh, and it's the average value of what? This little h guy, and what was he again? He was the kinetic energy of an electron and its potential attraction to all the nuclei. So basically all the energy that you can ascribe to a single electron. 
So if I had one electron in orbital I, what would its average kinetic energy plus potential to the nuclei be? It would be that. Okay, so it's kind of the energy of electron I. Um, so that, hopefully that makes sense. It's not a big deal, really. Um, yeah, so I think I just said that bullet. Uh, and we're assuming our chi's are normalized, otherwise I'd need a denominator in that expression. But I'm trying to keep the math easy, so we'll assume we have normalized chi's. Uh, and yeah, I just talked through that. H is kinetic plus potential. Now this is for a particular orbital i. I'm going to have to sum over all the occupied spin orbitals to get the total one electron contribution. But that's trivial. Uh, now what about this? these um, two electron terms? We had a, a, a couple different versions of that. I had the iijj and the ijji. So what do these things mean? Well, they arise due to the repulsion between electrons, okay? And so let's kind of look at this uh, double integral here. Um, what do I make of this thing? Well, look at this guy here. Chi i star of x1 times chi i of x1, that looks like a psi star psi. Except here, instead of a full-blown psi, it's a, a chi, it's a wave, wave function, if you like, for one electron. But this would tell you if an electron was in orbital chi i, then the probability of finding it at location x1, y1, z1, and with spin omega 1 would be chi star i of x1 times chi i of x1. It's our normal psi star psi kind of thing. So it's the probability that electron 1 is in orbital i is located at position x1. And then the same thing's going on here. This is the probability that an electron in orbital chi j is located at some particular point x2. Okay, interesting. Now, if electron 1 was at location x1, and if electron 2 was at location x2, then what would their Coulomb repulsion be? Well, it would be the distance between those two points. Um, and the spin part doesn't matter for the Coulomb's law part. Um, and the distance is 1 over r12. So this is normal Coulomb's law between two electrons. And the only reason it's this complicated uh, eight-dimensional integral is because we don't actually know where the electrons are. So we have to work in terms of where they might be. And we say, well, if it was here and if it was there, then the Coulomb's law uh, would be 1 over r12. Do I know they're there? No. So I have to integrate over all possible places they might be, which is over all space, and then uh, multiply my Coulomb's law by the probability that electron 1 is here and electron 2 is there. So it's really normal Coulomb's law just generalized to deal with the fact that the electrons are delocalized in space and we don't know where they are. And so we have to consider all possible locations of where they are and then multiply each pair of locations by the probability that you'll simultaneously get an electron here and an electron there. Um, so on the surface of it, it looks complicated, but in reality, this um, hopefully makes sense to you what's going on. Okay, yeah, Coulomb repulsion. And I integrate it over all the possible locations. So overall, this thing IIJJ means the Coulomb repulsion between electron 1 in orbital I and electron 2 in orbital J, knowing that those electrons are all smeared out in space with different probability distributions. Now, you might remember my equation for the Hartree-Fock energy. There was another two electron term. Uh, there was this guy had a minus sign in front of it, IJJI. Uh, is this the same thing? Well, um, I can apply my decoder here to put it in integral notation. And again, remember, I'm keeping things in a certain order. Electron one is on the left, electron two is on the right. Um, and uh, the first index and the third index of the chi's get a stars on them. Uh, until I give up and say we're using real orbitals and then we won't care about that. But anyway, um, so it means this thing. Now, what's the physical interpretability of this? Uh, well, it reminds you of what we talked about on the previous slide. 
And that one, I had a nice physical interpretation for this product here. It's like Psi Star Psi. And this one here, it's like Psi Star Psi. Um, and this guy, if you compare the two, they look very similar, but you see that I've swapped a couple indices. This used to be an I on the previous slide. See, it was I. Now it's J. Uh, and then likewise, this one used to be J, but now it's I. Uh, and so for that reason, this particular guy is called an exchange integral. Uh, and uh, if you like, you can see it over here, like I just described, or also on the left. IJJI is obviously an exchange of indices from IIJJ, where you could say swap index two and index four and, uh, you know, uh, arrive at this guy. So it's the same uh, mathematical structure in a way, but the indices got swapped. Um, and unfortunately, that's about all I could say about it. It doesn't have the nice physical meaning that um, the Coulomb term does, this so-called exchange term. It's there, but um, it's, it's harder to connect to a physical meaning other than to say is somehow related to the uh, Coulomb repulsion, except that I've had to scramble a couple of the indices um, due to the mathematics of Slater's rules that we're uh, not uh, working through right now. Yeah, so those are the indices that got swapped compared to the Coulomb integral. So, yeah, just falls out of the math. Not much else we can say about it. Okay, so coming back to our expression, now that I've walked you through what these terms mean, here's your Hartree-Fock energy. One electron term, electron kinetic energy, electron and nuclear attraction, two electron term, electron electron repulsion, this first term makes good sense physically. It really is Coulomb repulsion between an electron and a spin orbital I and spin orbital J. This one's kind of a mathematical artifact that has something to do with uh, generalizing the first term uh, here in the two electron term to account for the, um, the interchangeability or anti-symmetry of electrons in uh, quantum mechanics. Let's take a simple example like helium atom and actually write down what the Hartree-Fock energy of that would be in terms of these symbols, one electron integrals, two electron integrals. And uh, once we do that, I think you see it, that writing that symbolically is a very, very easy exercise. So first off, helium atom, uh, two protons, two electrons. Um, if we know a little chemistry, we know that uh, using alpha-bow principle, you'd fill the 1s orbital before you fill any other orbital. And the 1s orbital can take two electrons. One of them will have an alpha spin, one will have a beta spin. Uh, so let's call them 1s alpha and 1s beta. Um, and I'm going to work in terms of these spin orbitals, chi. So let me number them, and let's just call them chi 1 and chi 2. Why not? That seems simple. I'll come back to this other kind of notation a little later. But for now, let's just say... Chi 1, Chi 2. And I sometimes, you know, chemists draw these little diagrams where they draw a molecular orbital as a horizontal line, and then they'll use up and down arrows to say if they have any electrons that's got in it, and if those electrons are spin up or spin down. Uh, so here we go. You got a spin up electron, that's the alpha guy, and spin down electron. And um, these numbers are the spin orbital numbers, 1 and 2. Okay. So in terms of that, what does this above expression turn into? Well, uh, I sum over the electrons. So there are two electrons. So it's a sum with two terms in it. And I just put the index in the bra and the ket. So here's a 1H1, and then here's a 2H2. And that's all I have is two electrons. Likewise, here I sum over unique pairs. If I have two electrons, how many unique pairs do I have? Exactly one pair, the 1-2 pair, or the 2-1 pair, depending on what you're favorite way of numbering them is. Here I've called it i greater than j, so okay, fine. So that will give me 2211, and then this one is a 2112. Congrats! You've now written down the Hartree-Fock energy for helium atom in terms of one and two electron integrals. Now, somebody, hopefully a computer, has to then go grind out what these integrals really are, but symbolically, that's it. So this is a piece of cake to write these kind of things down. Um, yeah. 
Now, is this as far as we can simplify it before we hand it off to uh, somebody who's good at calculus or a computer? Well, possibly we can do a little more work. On